Here's our demotivational poster for the day, and it's funny if you like um, Michael from Vsauce. He did a, made a channel for a while, it was on YouTube Red, now it's free, called Mindfield, where he was talking about how, uh, well, how and why people laugh. And along the way, he mentioned that in a setting where you're alone and you're watching a show, you're less likely to laugh unless you hear other laughter. So if there's someone sitting next to you and they laugh, you're more likely to, likely to laugh. Now, that's the reason that laugh tracks are used in a lot of shows. So, sitting at home, you're probably not going to laugh at this, but it is kind of a humorous picture. And it really gets at the heart of what we're talking about here, which are brakes and clutches. And I like this. Your, your truck has brakes, the massive hunk of stone doesn't. <laughs> a little bit of foresight and thought is uh, useful. And really, that's probably what I'm worst at, so I'd probably be the the guy driving this truck and not thinking when I slammed on my brakes and destroyed the, the cab. So, Anyway, I thought it was a funny picture. It's appropriate for this topic because we're going to approach uh, brakes and clutches. So that's the topic, brakes and clutches. <clears throat> and what does a clutch to do? Well, all a clutch really does is connect or disconnect a, a power source from a driven machine. That's really all that it does. Uh, and it to say that that's all it does, I guess that's not fair because it needs to engage often smoothly, right? You don't want a, a jarring engagement that can cause problems with the machine, break the machine, and, and cause all sorts of problems. Brakes, on the other hand, their purpose is to slow or stop a load that's moving or control motion of a device. Now, there is, although brakes and clutches are similar and so they're put in the same chapter, there is a significant difference in the two in terms of how much power they're supposed to absorb. If you think about what a brake is doing, its job is to take one form of energy, which is a, a motion type of energy, of kinetic energy, and turn it into thermal energy. That's, that's the goal of a brake. A clutch, on the other hand, while it does dissipate some energy as thermal energy, it's supposed to go from an disengaged to engaged or vice versa, hopefully being designed well to minimize the amount of energy that's lost during that time. So brakes are sort of, you can think of brakes as being made to take more abuse than a clutch. So there are similar similarities between the two. Uh, both are used to control motion of some type. Uh, most brakes employ some type of friction, whether it's uh, mechanical friction or um, basically eddy currents and all sorts of different devices that can be used to, to apply a resistive force. Um, one big difference, of course, is that a clutch is used to make a load speed up, whereas brakes are used to decelerate uh, a load. So that's another obvious uh, difference between the two. There are actually several different types of clutches. There are clutches that transmit torque without any slip, uh, and then there are uh, clutches that use friction and therefore they slip during engagement. And as I said before, one main reason for this is so that you don't have as much shock or jerk being transmitted through the machine and causing damage or an uncomfortable ride, say in your car, for example. Uh, now, one problem with friction clutches is that they do slip once the torque reaches a maximum rating. Now, if a positive engagement clutch slips, that means that you've got teeth that are broken off, okay? The, the clutch is shot at that point. If a friction clutch slips, it's probably either overheated or it's worn or something like that, and, and the, the situation can be remedied without replacing the entire clutch. Now, there's a couple of common types. There are axial-type clutches and rim-type clutches and brakes as well. Um, and we'll talk about both those types here in a little bit. I had an experience with a clutch that was slipping. It was pretty interesting. The, the clutch in my car, it's actually still the same clutch that I experienced this with, it's in decent shape. It's starting to show its age. You know, you can kind of tell when you let the clutch out. And as if the engine RPM's too high and, you know, I let the clutch out, it'll slip a little bit before it really engages and grips and, and takes off. But I took my daughter to Lights Under Louisville one time. If you've never been there, it's over at the Mega Caverns around Christmas time. And you can drive your car through the, the caverns and look at all the lights. And it was pretty neat. I have a sunroof, moonroof, so I opened up and she was younger at the time. I think she was maybe three or four. I let her kind of stand up because the cars were moving very slowly. So I let her stand up and look out at all the lights through the, the moonroof. Uh, and she really enjoyed it. Uh, it was interesting. I was in a line of cars and so I was constantly having to engage the clutch uh, and then release the clutch re repeatedly. Every time you engage and release the clutch, there's slippage that occurs. 
And so the clutch material heats up. When it heats up, its properties change. It was really interesting. By the time we got to the end of this, and it was probably, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes, something like that. By the time we got to the end of this and I went to accelerate to get onto the highway, my clutch slipped really bad because there had been so much starting and stopping, right, uh, speeding up and slowing down with that clutch that the friction properties of it had changed temporarily since I had overheated the clutch. Now, I didn't overheat it to the point where smoke was coming out and the clutch was completely damaged. Once it cooled back down, it was fine. I probably did a little bit of damage to the clutch during that little episode, but it was worth it for her, I guess. Here's a couple of uh, positive type clutches or positive engagement type clutches. Uh, there are ones with square jaws where the uh, jaws can move axially, axially along the shaft to engage and disengage. And they can in be engaged at low RPM. So you think about the, the speed. One item's already going to be turning, right, because it's a power source. And so the, about the maximum speed you can uh, accommodate with a square jaw, the difference in speed is about 10 RPM or so. Uh, you really can't uh, engage at much higher RPM than that. There are spiral jaws that are shaped a little bit differently so that when they engage there's a good chance they'll they'll slip into place and you can see the spiral jaw clutch there and you can engage those up to about 150 RPM or so just depending on the clutch and the manufacturer specifications. Now moving from positive to friction clutches there's a couple of different types shown here one is a cone clutch and the other is a disc clutch uh, the interesting thing about this, you've probably never seen a cone clutch. Even if you've worked on your car, this is not like drum brakes on the back end of a, a pickup truck, for example. A cone clutch is literally a, a clutch shape that is part of a cone. And so you can see the, the engagement there. I'll try to highlight it with my mouse. So you can see right here, we're looking at a cross section. There'll be friction material there and friction material up here. And of course, that's revolved around the entire uh, cone surface. And that, that piece can slip in and out of the, the mating female cone and therefore have friction and uh, engagement. Uh, the disc clutch, something interesting about the disc clutch, if you've ever had a motorcycle and you've worked on a motorcycle, these are pretty common on that type of vehicle. And the interesting thing about them is that the, the disc clutch, uh, when it's like you see here in the picture, it can have multiple discs in it and that gives you more frictional surface area and therefore uh, reduces the wear on one clutch. It also increases the frictional torque because you have multiple discs and all the friction torque uh, adds from each individual disc. <coughs> in a uh, motorcycle, these clutches are, oh, maybe four, five, six inches in diameter, maybe up to eight for a big one. Um, if you ever have replaced the clutch in a manual vehicle, a vehicle with a manual transmission, You've probably also replaced the clutch plate there, and what you'll notice is that even for a small car, the clutch plate on a, a car is typically much larger, on the order of 12 you know, to 24 inches in diameter. About 24 inches would be a pretty big clutch, but you get the idea. They're a lot larger than the clutches that go on a motorcycle. And the, the torque that a motorcycle engine can generate and the acceleration that motorcycles have is pretty impressive, so they actually have pretty good clutches. But the reason that the clutch on the motorcycle is stacked up with multiple plates and a smaller diameter for compactness so that it can fit in the motorcycle area a little better. On the other hand, in a car, since you've got a, a big engine anyway, you can afford a large uh, pressure plate uh, and, and really that, that moment arm from the frictional material to the center of the clutch is much larger and so you don't need as much material. So there are some differences or two types of, of uh, friction clutches that you may or may not have encountered. There are also rim friction clutches and all of these things we're looking at, all these types of clutches can actually be used as brakes. All you really need to do is just ground one side, right? If you've got two pieces that can move that are separated by a clutch, if you ground one side then it becomes a brake. So that's, there, there's really a lot of overlap between the two types of machine elements. Uh, a rim friction clutch is a little bit different. There's a couple of types here. Uh, the classic type is a band clutch, and you've probably not seen a band clutch, but you may have seen a band brake. If you ever had a, a go-kart as a kid, you may have had a, a round drum with a band that goes around it. When you press your brake, that band tightens up and slows the, the, the go-kart down. Um, a band clutch, on the other hand, is a little bit different because the band itself has to be on a rotating shaft, and that's what you see here in the figure. Uh, and of course you have to have some way of tightening and loosening the band as it 
rotates around with the shaft. Uh, but by analogy, it's very similar to a, a band brake. Uh, there are another class of rim friction clutches that are sort of like a combination between a friction clutch and a, a positive engagement. They're not, technically, they are friction clutches, but if they slip, it's probably going to cause damage to the, the uh, element. And these are overrunning clutches, and if you look, you'll see on the left uh, a couple of overrunning clutches, one that uses uh, balls as the element, another, one's the other, another one that uses a sprag type element. And basically what happens is in one direction, the ball or the sprag either pivot or are wedged into place and prevent relative motion between the inner and the outer race. Uh, in the other direction, however, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, th there's basically no frictional torque. One can move faster than the other. And what these are commonly used for is the output of motors and things where the load is allowed to spin down. So if you think about a motor driving a load, the motor is the thing that's turning the fastest until you switch it off. And so then the motor will start to slow down, but it could be that the machine has so much inertia it'll just keep spinning for a long time. And maybe you don't want to slow down the machine, you just want to let it coast down. Well, an overrunning clutch would allow you to do that. It would prevent uh, positive engagement between the motor shaft and the load in one direction. There are many different types of brakes, of course. Everything we've seen so far can be used as a brake. All the clutches we've seen. There's, there's drum brakes that can have internal or external shoes. If you've ever worked on the rear end of a pickup truck, you've probably seen internal shoe drum brakes. Uh, but those could be used as a clutch as well. Uh, there are, of course, band brakes, as I've mentioned. You can use that cone clutch that I pointed out earlier as a cone brake. Um, there are also, of course, disc brakes. If you've worked on a car's front end brakes, and most rear brakes nowadays are disc brakes. Uh, but there are also plate or axial type brakes as well. Now, when we're talking about drum shoes or drum brakes, uh, there are two different types of shoes. There's internal and external. And while you may have seen internal shoes, you probably have not seen external shoes. External shoes are more common in industry because in industry you want access to the, the most commonly wear items, right? All the items that wear over time, you want to have access to them so you can replace them easily. So the external shoe type brake is more popular in industry because the shoes are just right there. You don't have to remove a drum to get to them like you do with a vehicle. Now the reason that trucks typically use drum brakes with internal shoes is that you want the brake surface to remain dry and one way to do that is to protect it by the drum itself because brakes fade they what do I mean by brake fade well they operate less effectively uh, number one when they heat up but number two when they get wet and so you want to try to prevent as much moisture as possible uh, from getting into the brake area band brakes are interesting there's a couple different configurations that can be used for applying uh, tension to the brake band. Um, you have to be careful about the direction of rotation, however. If you think about uh, figure A here, you'll notice that the lever is being pulled up with force F in order to pull the, the, the band at point T2. Point T1 is just connected to ground and doesn't move. But point T2 pulls down. Now understand this drum is rotating on a shaft and it doesn't do anything but rotate. It doesn't translate. Okay, so as you pull on T2 by pulling up on the handle out at A, that pulls the brake tight. Now, if the brake were rotating the other way, the brake would be fighting your, your applied action. And what can happen is skipping, basically. Uh, it's not a good thing, typically, and so y you want the, you know, in this figure, you'd want the uh, load to rotate counterclockwise in this view. On the other hand, if you put the pivot point on the other side, like in figure B, then the load would have to rotate in the opposite direction. And that way, uh, again, you avoid skipping problems. Uh, now, depending on the, going over to C, depending on dimension B1, uh, yeah, B1 and B2, that would depend on which direction the, uh, the drum should rotate as you apply force uh, F to turn the lever and tension up the band. Um, one nice thing about this setup is you can fine-tune it. A, a lot of times it's hard to get the right spacing for, you know, in figure A and B, that dimension capital B, it's hard to get the right spacing where the brake's not just very sensitive. 
figure C is nice because as you pull up on the handle, you release one side and tension the other side. And so you're, you're basically just moving the whole band a little bit, uh, but increasing the tension just, just ever so slightly. So uh, by playing with B1 and B2, you can um, change the sensitivity of the brake to the handle, and you can also uh, de design the direction of rotation. Some details about a cone brake. Notice that this looks a whole lot like a cone clutch. Well, there's some terminology here. Lowercase d is the smallest diameter on the cone, and uppercase d is the largest diameter on the cone, and then alpha is what's called the cone angle. Now, all these things are related to the actuation force F. Now, you notice that that cone has to be able to slide uh, axially, uh, whether it's sliding along the shaft or the whole shaft moves with it, you've got to be able to apply force to that cone to engage it with the female cone side so that uh, you can engage the brake and um, actuate it, basically. But we'll get to all of that uh, a little bit later. There, in the example problems, I've got a lot more detail, and there's more detail in the chapter, too, about the equations that relate those parameters together. So you'll watch those after these, uh, these lecture videos. If you've ever worked on the front wheels of your car, or nowadays a lot of rear wheel uh, wheels on cars as well, you've probably seen disc brakes. And disc brakes are a little bit different. There's something here called a caliper, and the caliper is usually a sort of a, like a C-clamp that can slide axially uh, relative to the, the disc itself. And what happens is the disc is rotating, and this caliper usually is a, the, the, the brake pads are usually activated by a, um, uh, a hydraulic source. So when you press your brakes, you're pushing hydraulic fluid into the cylinder. What that does is that applies force to two braking pads on either side of the disc. And since the caliper is usually grounded, as the, the disc rotates, what happens is the, the caliper squeezes the disc and provides a frictional torque to slow down the load, in this case your car. But the, it's important that the caliper be able to slide back and forth. If you've ever worked on your brakes and you took out the brake pads and you looked at one and it looked fine, the other one looked like it was about shot, your caliper is probably not sliding appropriately. Probably when force is being applied, it's just really being applied to one side of the disc. And of course, that's damaging to the disc as well as uh, the brake pads and something that needs to be rectified. But anyway, these are disc brakes and they're relatively common uh, as well. There are also plate brakes. Now, there's also plate clutches. Uh, you've probably not seen a I mean, a, technically, in a manual transmission, a pressure plate is a plate-type clutch. It usually doesn't look quite like this, where there's just two halves that are pressed together. In a, a plate-type clutch, there's a pressure plate that goes in between two surfaces, the flywheel and the, uh, I may not be using the right terminology, uh, but basically there's another side that has springs in it that pushes and, and clamps on the the plate. You might want to look that up and see what that looks like. Those are not as common in the industry. What's more common are plate type clutches and brakes. Uh, these are simpler devices and basically they're just annular regions. You're seeing it in cross section here so that you have to push these two together in order to transmit torque. So again we've got our outer diameter capital D, inner diameter lowercase d, and then the actuating force F. Again we'll talk about more detail about this because there's there's a lot of concern with the amount of power that each square inch of brake surface absorbs. If you think about it, when you apply a brake, you have to dissipate, dissipate a certain amount of, of energy. But the rate at which you dissipate that energy is also very important. This is why when you have a, a race car, it's important to not just upgrade the engine. You also have to upgrade the brakes because the brakes will have to slow the car down from a higher speed in a relatively short period of time. And so you want the brakes to be able to dissipate energy just as quickly as possible without overheating and without failing. So the, the amount of power, essentially, that each square inch uh, takes is really important, and that has to do with the wear ratio. Uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. There's many ways of applying that force to press, press the brake or the clutch together. Uh, manual activation is possible. I mean, you can just push on it manually. Uh, but most clutches and brakes require a lot more force than a human being can apply. And so you saw in the band brake, for example, you saw a lever where the force applied by a person's hand would be multiplied or by their foot would be multiplied. It's fairly common to have springs apply uh, force uh, 
for brakes or clutches, whenever you hear a semi, for example, and you stop next to it and you hear a release of air, uh, what you're hearing is air coming out of the brakes and letting the spring apply the brake pads. Um, it turns out that you have to have air pressure to, um, to release the brake. So uh, in the case of a car also, for example, a, a car's clutch in a manual transmission car, the uh, pressure plate is regularly just engaged, and that's engaged by a, a spring. Now, it's not a spring like you would think of that we've designed in this class, not a spiral spring. They're typically springs that are, um, uh, uh, actually, those are cantilevered springs. I can't think of the name of it right now. Not leaf springs, but uh, another type. I can't think of the word. But just cantilevered, um, just stiff pieces of metal that apply force to engage the, the clutch. Uh, there are also centrifugally engaged clutches so that when one element starts spinning faster, a centrifugal uh, weight flies out against a spring and then engages the clutch. If, again, you ever had a go-kart when you were a kid, you probably had this type of clutch on the engine output shaft. And what would happen is when you press the gas, the engine speed would increase, which would throw out some weights a little bit against a spring and engage the friction surface inside of what was actually a drum-type clutch. So that's centrifugal activation or actuation of a clutch. Uh, there's also pneumatic, and we've mentioned hydraulic. Pneumatic's fairly common in industry. One of the problems in industry with hydraulic fluid, excuse me, <coughs> one of the problems with uh, hydraulic fluid in industry is you always end up with leaks. It's, uh, it can be a real pain. Now, if you have an air leak, it's a lot easier to clean up than a hydraulic leak. And so pneumatics are fairly, um, what shall I say, popular in industry because they're, they're relatively clean by comparison and easy to maintain. Uh, now, of course, the problem is you can't get near as much force. I mean, you could, but it's not as easy to get as much force out of pneumatic systems as you get out of a hydraulic system. Uh, there's also electromagnetic actuation, uh, which is just basically an electromagnet pulling in the clutch so there's, or, or brake. So there's many different types of ways to apply the force that either engages or disengages the clutch or brake. Now, along the way, we're going to use our torque power speed equation quite a bit because we're talking about torque being applied by the, uh, the clutch in order to transmit power uh, and at a particular speed. So the conversion factors I've shown you before will be quite handy. I've included them here on the slide for your convenience. Now, <clears throat> for brakes, we like to apply what's called a service factor. In the idea of a service factor is that we can, can derate the brakes or the clutch. Um, and most of the time with brakes, you just use a, a factor of one, and that's just average conditions. Now, if you have severe conditions, say you have a big, uh, I don't know, imagine a, a very large earth-moving truck. You've seen pictures of them, right, where the tires are so big that a person stands next to it and doesn't even come up halfway to, you know, to the center line of the tire. Um, and imagine that you've got a huge dump truck like that loaded with, with earth or coal or whatever it's moving, and it has to go down an incline. Well, in that case, you'd probably want a service factor applied to the brakes because the brakes are going to have to be activated for quite a bit of time. Now, of course, it's possible to use the engine to slow down the, the truck on a truck that size, but you understand what I'm saying. When there's a period of time where the brakes have to be applied over a long period and they're going to heat up and they're going to change their properties, you want to apply a service factor to it. Now, in a clutch, you actually expect uh, some different types of abuse. If you have something simple like a, a motor that you're disengaging, well, a motor has fairly smooth torque, so it doesn't really matter at what position the rotor shaft happens to be when the clutch engages. The amount of torque that the motor uh, transmits through the clutch is pretty much consistent. Now, when you have a gasoline or diesel engine, we'll go to the opposite end of the scale, then you want to apply a very large service factor because with a gasoline or a diesel engine, you've got pistons that are coming around, and on the power stroke, there's a torque spike, right? As the piston uh, is pushed down very rapidly by the uh, expanding gases above it, the, there's a spike in the torque output from the crankshaft. And that torque output means that it's really going to be twisting, and it's going to speed up a little bit. There's going to be jerk there. And so as the clutch engages, there's no way to have a really, really smooth engagement because it's going to slip some. 
And that, the way we account for that and the extra abuse that it causes to a clutch is with a service factor. And so the one we'll use in this class is 5 for any uh, combustion engine like that. Uh, if we have varying loads in a high torque motor, then we'll use 4. Varying loads with a normal motor, we'll use 2.75. If we have a heavy duty uh, 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 application where the load is being accelerated, we'll use 3. If it's a light duty where the load is applied at pretty much full speed, they're already both turning, then we'll use 1.5 instead. Now, as I said before, the frictional torque between the two elements generates heat, right? I mean, there's slippage there. So there's a force through distance. Just like when you rub your hands together, there's friction there, and you can feel heat, right? You feel thermal energy. And so what's happening there is work can't be destroyed, right? Or, well, I shouldn't say that. Energy can't be destroyed. The work is transformed into thermal energy. And so we have to design our brakes and clutches so that they can absorb all of this thermal energy without degrading and, and uh, no longer being able to perform. So the equation we're going to use for plate clutches or brakes, uh, and this will be a general equation that's actually useful for more than just plate clutches or brakes, but this equation just simply allows us to calculate the frictional torque applied based on the friction coefficient, the normal force, and the mean radius of the plate. So if you think about what's going on here between the two surfaces, this is one of the simplest brakes, so it's easy to understand. This is just basically an annular region, like so, right? So it's a circle within a circle, and there's a, there's a region of brake material uh, where there's going to be contact and there's going to be slippage. Well, if there's slippage and there's a frictional force on the, um, the, the plate, that, that frictional force has a moment arm from sort of the mean radius down to the center of the, uh, the plate clutch or brake. And that moment arm times that frictional force then ends up generating a frictional torque. So the, in this equation, there's a few things you may not be used to. If you're used to physics and dynamics and classes with me like that, you're used to looking at a friction coefficient as mu. But in this case, your author is using f, lowercase f, as the coefficient of friction. Okay, So this is the number that's going to be somewhere between probably about 0.1 to 1. And then in the normal force, you're probably used to that. That's actually the, ap the, uh, the applied force. In the figure here, that would be F. That's the force that's squeezing the two plates together. And then RM is the mean radius. If you, you think about it, you realize that you've got an outer diameter of this annular region, capital D, and an inner diameter, lowercase d. So exactly where is that frictional force applied in that, that region? Well, it's at the mean radius. And we'll show you how to calculate the mean radius in the example problems. <coughs> Pardon me. Now we get to wear rating. And wear rating is something that's very important because as a clutch or a brake engages, there's slippage. And so there's frictional torque. And that frictional torque is acting at a relative speed, right? There's a difference in the speed between either ground in the case of a brake and the moving shaft or two shafts in the case of a clutch. And that relative speed is what causes uh, frictional heating of the brake surface. So the frictional power that the brake has to absorb is calculated just simply based on the uh, power torque speed equation. Now the wear rating is something that we use to quantify how much power each square inch of brake material has to absorb. And so the wear rating is simply the frictional power divided by the total surface area of the brake material or the clutch material. We usually talk about this more in the context of a brake than a clutch, but uh, you could talk about it for either, because a clutch does, of course, absorb energy just like a brake does, uh, although usually not as much. So um, there's some guidelines here, some recommendations that uh, if you have a clutch that is frequently engaged, it's engaged and released and engaged and released, kind of like when I was driving my car under uh, uh, in uh, the mega caverns for lights under Louisville. Uh, that would be a frequent use application because I was constantly having to engage and disengage the clutch. So in that case, the clutch should be rated to take about four uh, hundredths of a horsepower per square inch. Now probably my clutch is designed for more like a tenth of a horsepower per square inch. That's why it failed or it faded as it was applied too frequently. A uh, tenth of a horsepower per square inch is what's recommended for average service. And then if the clutch is very infrequently used, then you can uh, 
typically apply about um, four tenths of a horsepower per square inch. So those are just guidelines for uh, brakes and, uh, well, more for clutches. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. It's more for brakes, not for clutches. I'm sorry. You can use it for clutches, but for a clutch, well, really, you could use it for either. Um, but it, it doesn't matter. Okay, so speaking of the coefficient of friction, what numbers are we going to use? Because you might remember in physics and dynamics that you were always just given the coefficient of friction unless it was something you had to find through experiment. Um, different materials have different friction coefficients. So here's some representative coefficient of friction ranges at least for various materials. So you see molded compounds, woven materials, uh, centered materials, cork, for example, wood, cast iron. You see all of those, those ranges there that are reasonable numbers representing the coefficient of friction uh, for that type of material. Now, you notice that they've got two columns here. One says dry and the other one says in oil. And you might look at that and say, well, wait a second. Why on earth would I make a break or a clutch and then put oil on the surface? Because that's going to make it slip. Well, there's actually a good reason for doing this. This is a, more common in industry than you might realize based on your, your experience with everyday things like cars and any clutches you might find in your house. Uh, the reason is because if you immerse the brake or clutch in oil, although you sacrifice friction coefficient, right, because you can see they're a lot lower than the dry versions, although you sacrifice the friction coefficient, what you gain is a material, a fluid, that can help uh, wick away heat from the brake or the clutch. And so since in industry a lot of times you have static installations where the weight of the machine can be supported by the foundation of the building, the size of the clutch or the brake is not all that critical. What you're more interested in is not having to maintain the thing or I should say work on it all the time. You don't want it to break. You want it to be reliable. And so it's uh, often worthwhile to immerse a brake or a clutch in oil and oversize it, in other words, make it a very large brake or clutch for the application in order to avoid maintenance, or I should say, in, in order to avoid failure. Now, the pressure ranges that the material can take in PSI are also listed there. And you'll notice that cork, while it has a relatively high friction coefficient, you can't press on it very much, right? Which makes perfect sense, otherwise you would deform it. And so you see various uh, pressure ranges, how much uh, load can be applied per area for the various materials. Here's the equation we're going to use for a cone clutch or brake. And so uh, you can kind of see how this works. If you look all the way on the right in the end view, you'll notice that the frictional force, capital F subscript lowercase f, is equal to the friction coefficient, which is lowercase f, times the actuation force n. Now we have to be careful here because the actuation force, I'm sorry, not the actuation force, excuse me, the, um, in fact, wait a second, why do we have in there, I think that might be a misprint. I haven't noticed that until now from the book. What we should have is the frictional force uh, there. And, oh, 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 I, that is the frictional force, I'm sorry. I'm getting confused because I'm thinking of the frictional torque already uh, from the equation. So we're calculating the frictional force. That's, that's the arrow going to the left. And it's equal to the normal force times the friction coefficient, which is, that makes perfect sense. What you have to be careful about is that that normal force is not equal to the actuation force. So look at the figure just to the left. Uh, it's not labeled, but it's just not the end view. It's the other view. And you'll notice that the normal force is at an angle uh, to a regular XY coordinate system. It's normal to the surface of the, the friction uh, cone. Now the actuation force F sub alpha, that's the force that's being used to push the cone into the, the female mating cone. Now if you think about this from a, a statics standpoint, the actuation force F alpha has to be balanced by the normal force N and the friction force in the, the prime direction along the, the uh, incline of the cone. You see that in, in the figure there. And what happens is, because of that cone angle, you can generate very high normal forces uh, based on a very s a relatively small axial force. And so cone clutches are really good because they're, they naturally or inherently have an ability to amplify uh, 
the applied force that's engaging the, the clutch or brake. So the mean radius is just at the center of the uh, clutch diameter, the friction surface diameter, uh, or the mean diameter is at the, the center of the, the frictional area diameter. And uh, unfortunately, I've got axial force listed as F sub A in, in my list there. And in the equation, it's F sub A. But you'll notice that on the figure, it's F sub alpha. Those are the same thing. I think in the book that was a misprint. I think it should be F sub A instead of F sub alpha. should probably update this figure. I didn't realize that until now, uh, actually. But that certainly should be F sub A, the actuation force. So you can see the statics have already been worked out for you so that you can calculate the frictional torque, frictional torque excuse me, in a clutch or brake. Okay, with drum brakes, there's two classifications. There's so-called short shoe and so-called long shoe brakes. Short shoe brakes are those that have a, a shoe arc angle less than 45 degrees. And for that, we just assume that the frictional force acts in the middle of the shoe. A long shoe has an arc angle more than 45 degrees, and the pressure along the shoe surface is not uniform. And so we can't assume that the friction just acts in the center of the shoe. So let's start off with a short shoe drum brake and look at it. Here's our equation for calculate, calculating the friction force and the frictional torque uh, from a short shoe drum brake. Again, we're just assuming that the frictional force acts at the center of the pad. You can see the pad there and the, the actuation arm with a load W being applied probably by a human's hand. Uh, you can see pivot point A and how pushing down with load W would engage the short shoe pad with the drum. Um, <clears throat> Now we're assuming that the, the force, the friction force, acts at the center of that shoe. And the statics have been worked out there for you as well. You could do this if you wanted to, but that, the frictional force is just there for you. And these are the equations that we need. Now if you look at that, it's kind of interesting because looking at the denominator of the frictional force, you can actually have very high friction forces by simply controlling the geometry of the brake. Notice that dimension A and B are dimensions that relate the position of the pivot point A to the contact point at the center of the short, uh, short shoe. And by playing with the value of A and B and knowing the friction coefficient F, you could actually drive that denominator very near zero and generate extremely large frictional forces for very small actuation force W and even short moment arm length L. And so that's something that we can play with. If you think about what's going on here too, you might realize that if you design this right, you can actually get the action of the brake to, um, uh, to help actuate, right? So as the brake is slowing down, the, the frictional force back on the lever can help to engage the lever, and that type would be a self-locking because the more friction force, the more actuation there is, which generates more friction force. So this is kind of an interesting type of brake, and we'll explore a little bit of that in the example problems. Long shoe brakes, as I said, have cone ang or not cone angles, have arc angles larger than 45 degrees. So you see a, an example here, and the angle would be, it looks like it'd be a theta 1, no, theta 2 minus theta 1 would be the arc angle of this long shoe brake. Very similar to a short shoe brake in the sense that there's a pivot point, an actuation force W uh, applying the brake against the drum. But to calculate the frictional torque there, it's a, a little more um, involved. And so um, you see the equation there that involves the two cone angles, uh, I keep saying cone angles, I'm sorry, the, two, the beginning and ending angle of the shoe. Uh, you see the friction coefficient, you see the actuation force W, the radius of the drum R, and then something labeled P sub max. What is that? Well, basically, this is just the maximum pressure that we can apply to the material. And there's a table you should mark in your book. It's table 22-2. And this table lists the various pressures that various materials can take at maximum. Again, I have an example problem uh, using um, or applied to long shoe drum brakes. So you should go check that out. So by design, most brakes are actually designed to use friction to help apply the, the brake. Um, and if you get to the point where no external actuation is required, then the brake is self-locking. Now, we'll explore that again in example problems. 
uh, in a band break, in order to calculate the frictional torque, you just need the difference in the, the tension between the two uh, ends of the band and then the radial uh, distance or the radial diameter of the drum, and that allows you to calculate the frictional torque.